afternoon. Welcome to the uh, House Lounge, and thank you all for coming down uh, for this important issue. Um, we're all here to discuss the future of uh, community service grant programs, and uh, as you all know, it's received a lot of media attention in the last several weeks. Uh, very appropriate. First, let me say this is, a, this is a program that everybody up here has inherited. It certainly predated me by, I would assume, decades. I'm not sure when it was started. And the Community Service Grant Program is essentially a program that's a list of community service agencies that perform needs, uh, that address the needs of our, our citizens, uh, our vulnerable groups of citizens, and provide vital state citizenry needs. However, it's a, it's a list of grants that are um, made by the General Assembly. And in finally reviewing these grants, um, we've come to the conclusion that there's a better way to administer state dollars. So I'm here to announce that the Community Service Grant Program, as we have known it, will cease and will be no more for terminating it. Community agencies do a wonderful job for and on behalf of our citizens. Um, and and we, we don't want to lose sight of that. There are vital citizenry needs that are being performed by community agencies that are not well performed by any other state department or, or state agency. And we're able to address those citizens' needs without having to hire additional state employees with all the benefits that uh, that entails. However, the current system, we've decided and concluded, lacks the appropriate amount of transparency. So in the future, we're going to address those community needs as follows, with either a direct appropriation in the budget, not a, in a list of community service grants, an appropriation in the budget, in the appropriate department, with the stated purpose of that. It'll be in the budget, it'll be there for everyone to see, it'll be transparent and subject to debate and discussion. There will be probably only a handful of those, those will be the bigger uh, community agencies that serve, that serve vital citizens' needs uh, that are not able to be replicated anywhere else. And it, there, we, we certainly have those. With the smaller community grants, we are going to appropriate funds to state departments to administer those funds. Um, and ensuring that the grants are Either at that point, they'll be issued, number one, by the state departments, not the General Assembly, and they'll go through an appropriate application process or a competitive bid process, as other grants are given out by charitable organizations. The current program is essentially roughly $11 million. We expect uh, a significant savings to that uh, as, as we reappropriate the dollars through the budgetary process as I previously explained. We believe that no General Assembly member should be employed by any community agency that is receiving state dollars through one of the above mentioned uh, appropriation processes. And that no dollars um, appropriated to a community agency shall be used for lobbying purposes. All agencies that receive federal dollars through one of the previously mentioned uh, appropriation methods will be subject to Auditor General review. I'm not saying audit, I'll leave it up to the Auditor General to employ best practices and it'll be, it'll be to determine that the state dollars are appropriately expended. These are large agencies that have functions that, that are totally separate and independent of state dollars and I'm not sure the Auditor General needs to audit them in their other functions. But relative to state dollars, any agency 
that receives um, state dollars will be subject to review or audit by the Auditor General, whatever the best practices for that review would be. I want to thank Chairman Abney and the Finance Committee for their hard work. They reviewed hundreds of grants. Um, I want to thank everybody from community agencies that came in and testified and explained what they were doing. We certainly learned that there are vital functions being performed by these state agencies, by these uh, community agencies. And I want to thank everybody in the public that's calling for reform. They highlighted an issue that the state can in fact do better. We gave it the appropriate attention for the first time in a long time, and we are going to commence with a process that will serve our community better. We're going to maintain addressing the community needs as is appropriate uh, and vital, but we're going to do it much more transparently uh, in a way that will gain the support of the public. So uh, I think this is a better process moving forward for everyone. So I want to thank everybody that had whatever role they had in moving us from the old process to the new process that I previously uh, uh, outlined. And I want to thank you all for being here. And at the appropriate time, after the Senate President addresses you, we'll, we'll be here for questions. Thank you. I believe the speaker has outlined the process for General, but I do want to recognize as he ended by saying that the Community Service Objective Grants have provided support for critical services for thousands of Rhode Island's needless residents. What have they done? They supported services such as food security for needy Rhode Islanders, housing and services for the homeless, services to protect victims of sexual abuse and victims of domestic violence veteran service, and much more. These type of allocations have also played an important governmental role. For example, the Department of Elderly Affairs, which does not provide a lot of direct services to provide for maintenance of effort, and core state services, which makes us eligible as a state for millions of dollars in federal matching funds, does that through allocations of funds to our senior centers and other critical services to seniors, such as meals on meals. The Department of Elderly Affairs, as I mentioned, then leverages their grants for additional federal dollars to further advance these vital missions. An important function of government is to provide support services such as these that are critical to helping providers. However, we also need to ensure that the process is as transparent and as accountable as possible. The measures we are discussing today will help to improve transparency. As the speaker has indicated, a line item appropriation in the annual budget proposal, where a recipient is named in the act under an appropriate department, open debate throughout the budget process, and any and all named recipients being subject to audit by the Bureau of Audits. As stated by the Speaker, not administered by the General Assembly, but rather by the Executive Branch of Government. This would include, as I alluded to, mission-driven funding allotments. A grant allotment would be budgeted in a certain department. For example, our Senior Center would in fact be funded through the Department of Elderly Affairs, however, through either a formulaic distribution based upon population and services provided, uh, and those departments would distribute those, or in some cases, perhaps on a competitive basis. However, as the speaker has said, in all cases, those grants would be subject to an order by the Bureau of Orders. And in closing, that the overall number of community service objectives will be significantly reduced as the process moves forward. Uh, thank you to all of you who have been patient through this process and 
recognize the finance chairs on both sides who are committed to accountability and transparency, but yet recognize the importance of these core state services and the necessity of the, their funding. And I thank the speaker for his recognition of that as well during this past two weeks. Away from all out of budget, and give us some estimates how much you're going to fund with the agencies and how much you're going to do in direct appropriations. And then I have a, a follow up question. I don't have the estimate, it'll be out tomorrow, so I'm not trying to be evasive. I don't know. I can tell you it'll be a couple of dozen direct line items for agencies, the larger ones, all of the smaller ones will be appropriations to departments and their witnesses. So it, it's a couple of dozen, so uh, it's going to be a, a relatively small number compared to the $11 million for the entire program. I, I don't know what the exact number is. Because of the agency, the pool, or mission-driven appropriations, how about the direct appropriations? The, the direct appropriations will be a couple of dozen in total. We haven't finished negotiating exactly which ones, but they'll be the larger ones. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's fair to say Crossroads might end up on the list. It's, it's a, a larger agency that serves a vital function for the citizens of the state of Rhode Island, a, a compelling community need. It's a function that there's no other department, so to speak, that um, directly addresses that. So it, it's those unique ones. There'll be a couple of dozen of them. The dollar amount, I'm not sure. I don't know if the Senate President's aware of what no, I think that the speaker said it correctly, and just so it's clear, so the child opportunity zones would be an example, where right now they are actually distributed to all child opportunity zones throughout the state through a formula. But, as has been discussed in recent days, not everyone was aware of them. So they would in fact be a recognized line item because they provide critical function statewide, a unique function that supports the education system throughout the state, sometimes known as COSIs, and distributed fairly. But that would, in fact, now be identified as a line item, which would be discussed and debated, and ironically, is often discussed and debated in the budget process, but now, and this is where I think my focus has been on transparency, while it was discussed and debated, the average citizen should be able to look at the budget document, see child opportunity zones, recognize that that is the funding, that is where it is directed, and that it is directed through the Department of Education. Who is going to decide what the agencies, whether it's going to be competitive by population, Maybe at the expense of some of the smaller communities. Is that something you're going to dictate formula from here, or are they each going to be given the opportunity to come up with growth? And with the General Assembly, can always indicate a formula. We do so for education and a lot of other appropriation areas. However, I don't expect that that's what we're going to do. I expect, on average, the agencies will determine whether it's a straight application process or a competitive bridge process. It's going to be a function of the executive branch to make that determination. I think that's a critical part of the change, Cassie, that the speaker is addressing. We are now delegating that responsibility to the agency. That is one of the critical elements of the reform that we are identifying today. A delegation of the legislative authority over the distribution of funds to the state agencies is a critical part of the reform. And we'll see this we're not talking about here from now. You will see it tomorrow. For both of you, if, if I might. Does this go far enough, do you feel, to restore public confidence in this system? Oh, absolutely. I, 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 I don't know what else you could do. I mean, grants right now are a politically charged word, but our state of Rhode Island depends on federal grants. Charitable, charitable organizations make grants all the time. Grants fulfill important state needs, important federal needs, important charitable needs, important needs for our scientific community. 
So it, what you need is a, a, a predictable, transparent process that serves the interests of, of the citizens. And we've, we've delegated much of the decision making to the executive branch. I think as the Senate President indicates, that's, that's the, uh, one of the more significant changes and I would, I would uh, call reforms. Uh, and there are other agencies that, that vitally need state appropriation uh, in order that we can take care of citizens needs day one, for instance. They, they address uh, victims of sexual assault. There's no other state agency that can appropriately do that. So without leaving that state need, the need of some of our uh, most vulnerable citizens unattended, you have to make that appropriation. So we are going to continue to address vital state needs through direct appropriations with transparency in the budget, subject to debate, and we're going to delegate the rest of the function to the executive branch. I, I, I don't know how else to do it. We've discussed it, we've brainstormed it, we've thought about it. This seems the best way to address the courts, uh, needs of our citizens while making the process transparent, predictable, and putting it in the appropriate place for the most part, which is the executive branch. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the big guys, the big, for the lack of a better term, crossroads, food bank, they're going to get their hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're just going to get it a different way, do a different process. What about what about the smaller branch? Parades, Boy Scouts, Little Leagues, all these things. How about right. two money? different two different grant programs? Let me address them both. We have smaller grants in the community grant system. That is the um, a lot of them. I was surprised to see were five, six thousand, four thousand, eight thousand dollars. Those are all being eliminated. You don't need to do them through the community grants. Uh, uh, program or, or do direct line item appropriations in the budget. So if they were small, you could actually get rid of them without imposing too much pain or discomfort in our community. So we eliminated those right off. So they, the direct appropriations are only going to be the big ones. Now there's the other program, the legislative grant uh, program. That's roughly a million dollars for the House, a million dollars for the Senate. That goes to senior centers, uh, little leagues, basically elderly folks and children and, and community needs. Those programs are going to remain intact. My experience is the citizens like those programs, those need groups appreciate those programs, and legislators are in a position to best target where in their communities those funds can go. There's probably not a better way to do that right now, so we're going to maintain those programs. Uh, so maybe those, maybe those programs are yeah, about a million each. Oh, yeah, that that's that's safe the way it is. Yes. They come through you. Yes. It's the, it's the right. Why would not yeah, the same level of transparency? transparency? Like, why wouldn't you think those need to be subjected to these new levels of transparency? Well, they're, first of all, they're much smaller. Some of them, like the one you gave to the Cranston Police Department, was quite large. That was $60,000. Yes, and that's addressing a vital Cranston community needs. So I'm, very, I'm very proud of that particular grant. We've got a motorcycle uh, detail uh, patrolling the streets of Cranston and, and the, the drug units uh, uh, got some assistance in, in Cranston. And so would you consider that. putting that one in the community grant program since it's so much larger than the typical legislative grant? Well, going forward we'll see how we address those. I mean, the community service grant program is, is not going to exist in the same way to address a need like that. Um, I was asked by the Cranston Police Department to address a Cranston need, and I addressed it as I deem most appropriate for the citizens of Cranston. Mm -hmm. um, looking forward, when we address the legislative grant program, those are generally the small ones. Those are the little leagues, those are the senior centers, those are the thousand, two thousand dollars to help kids buy equipment, help senior centers buy TV sets, run the program. Speaker, so speaker, it adds up to $2.2 million this year, 800 grants, and you control it without any vote, and she controls a million dollars without any vote. Is that good government? Is that the way it should be? No vote? Two people control well, it? There, no, there, well, there, 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 there is a vote. That, there's a line item in the budget for that, and everybody But the individual up. grants don't you and We have a JCLS process internally, and you're right, I get the last view on the grants. We have an ap application process. We then review them after the year is up. We make sure they give us their receipts and they comply with, with the purpose of the grant and so forth. This suggestion was made is divide them up equally amongst legislators. Uh, that was one of the proposed reforms. Just 
give everybody so many dollars in equal allotments to give out. First of all, you're going to give some agencies too much, some agencies too little, and second of all, nobody is going to be there to oversee them. In overseeing programs, you have administration costs. There's always cost associated with that. There has to be someone who's the final say or uh, decision maker on anything. On the big ones, we've given it to the to the um, the executive branch through uh, the, de the departments. On these, these go to community needs directly. There is nobody in the administration that would know. Excuse me, I'm speaking, and I'll be very happy to answer the next question. There will be nobody in the administration that knows my community or different representatives or senators' community the way they do. We know where the needs are. Those resources get expended to dependent folks with no administration costs. And, and it's a relative, I know it's, it's a significant amount of money, but it's a relatively small amount per grant, and we know how to target those. There's no other way you're going to do that without spending more on the program than the money you're giving out. So it, it's relatively efficient. There are states that vote on these grants individually, and, and we don't hear. But I don't think anybody's questioning who gets the money. I think the question is the process. Is it good government? Take yourself back to seventh grade, a seventh grade civics lesson. Is it good government that two people control two point two million dollars? Well, that's and it's and the critic. The criticism is that it buys you control over your body and it gets votes for the members of your body. Let, let, let me say this. I mean, because I know there's misinformation out there. Let me say this. First of all. The membership of the House and Senate vote on this, knowing that they get administered through JCLS. So we have a governance structure for them. Ultimately, in the House, I'm the last person to see them, and in the Senate, the Senate President is the last person to see them. However, the process, as I've indicated, is subject to process, it's, it's, it's transparent, and there's no other way to effectively do it. I have never, let me speak for myself, I'm not the Senate President. In the House of Representatives, everybody thinks it's a politicized pro process. I have never rejected an application from a Democrat, whether they were uh, in favor with me, so to speak, a Republican, anybody. The only thing I've ever done, whether it was a Democrat or a Republican, is taken a grant that looked like it was a little too big for a particular use and said, look, you're asking for four. Can you live with 2,500? Can you live with 2,000? If you can't, is it a particular need that needs addressing? And we'll address it. So I have never said no. So everyone says the speaker utilizes them to, to, to give out and, and curry favor. It's not what we use them for. It's not my practice. Everybody that's ever asked has gotten one. Not one, no. Slight adjustments. And that's why you need someone at the at the back end of the process, reviewing them and saying, does this make sense? You don't give them all with no review because sometimes I catch things. The more sets of eyes, the better. There has to be a final set of eyes. All I am is the final set of eyes. There is otherwise a process. And I have never said no. Yet I'm not going to say no to a community service grant. That's a community need. I know the suggestion is that they use for political purposes to keep us in office. That is patently false, and I, I defy you to find someone they got a note from me. I'm a community service grant that's asked. Is there, it's been criticized for decades, that program. Is I'm there any sorry, plan? Legislative. The legislative grant program has been criticized for decades. Is there any plan to look into that and potentially, why not vote as been, has been proposed before? Why not vote on each grant? Because we usually get those requests after the budget's passed. I, I, I might get them nine months from now. We're voting on the budget in two days. Members have no idea who they're going to give them out to. Otherwise, if, if we had a list, I'd be happy to put them on, and, and everybody would be happy to support them because their community needs them. That would be an extremely easy vote, and I'd be happy to do it. Now, if you can round up all of my representatives and all of the senators and get a list that we can vote on, I'd be happy to do it. Oftentimes, community groups ask for these grants as the year goes on, by the way, we're getting the parade, and you give us a grant for that, or the school has a vital function that we need books for this and there's no other resources for it, can, can, can you help us with that? It takes care of community needs. So if, if, if we had to rely 100% on that, there'd be no flexibility, and we wouldn't be able to address that, and we wouldn't know what those needs are. Because the problem the other states don't do it either. 
either one of you. Do you think that would add is the legislative agreement process under scrutiny was significantly reformed under Senator Mike Lenningham? It used to be, as Kathy may remember, that bills went in and there were hearings and that's how the process occurred way after the budget was passed. Now all grant requests for both the House and the Senate are in fact identified on the computer and are transparent and all the awards are also accessible online. One of the key reforms we're making today to the Community Service Objective Grants, which became necessary, <coughs> was that the General Assembly found themselves in a unique position of appropriating the, the funds but not administering or ensuring the accountability of how those funds were spent. It was sent off to the departments, and we were really just, they were lost after the budget passed. Now, the departments will make the appropriations, the departments will be accountable. The legislative grants, in fact, there is an application, they are all required to have 990s, they're all required to return receipts, and I will echo the speaker's uh, comments that they are divided appropriately between communities. If you look at the computer, what you'll find, for example, is the urban areas such as Providence that have agencies that serve more expanded agencies are often addressed through those grants <coughs> by receiving more than, for example, a suburban community. What you will also find is that in the Senate, as in the House, that there are that there are only senators who are not receiving grants are those who chose not to apply. In those communities, we have always ensured receive their grants um, because every you know library, every community service, whether they're in Lincoln or Newport, Princeton or Providence deserves to be supported. Oftentimes, these grants are used uh, to match municipal grant programs as well as private donations and are often part of a tripartite funding process for many of these nonprofit organizations. But a critical part, because oftentimes private donors want to see some state commitment and a municipal commitment as well. So I think that as, if you go through one of the critical reforms that we've made today, the speaker focused on, is the delegation of legislative authority for appropriation to the executive branch, who will now be held accountable for administering them, and the Bureau of Audits will continue to monitor those grants. For the General Assembly, on the legislative side, it is the Auditor General, a reform that was put in place um, in the mid-2000s, required a sampling of those legislative grants on a regular basis, and that will continue and perhaps even be increased. Your Honor, the General Assembly is having trouble getting information from Mr. Gauss and AEP. He's having trouble getting information from AEP. Your Honor, the General said that. It's been a month. Any, any update on that? I, I have no update. Um, I, I would expect that that's still the situation today. Well, Are you going to add that that's one of the reasons that the Community Service Program has are you going to do anything to try to get that information? You've already asked one, Kathy. Yeah, Speaker, yeah. Have you, are you going to do anything uh, to try to get that information? Are you going to subpoena him? Are you going to, or is it just, if he won't give you the money, that money is his forever and we'll never uh, find out? Well, uh, the, the, the simple answer to that is I, I, I think that it's going to be difficult for us to get the, the documentation. However, I believe there is a either state and or federal investigation ongoing, so they probably have the records at this point, they're probably looking at them, so they're, I expect it will be a very thorough review as they should be, but that's the reason why you had to look at the Community Service Grant Program and perform it, and, and, and I think everybody involved in that process. When you're dealing with the smaller grants, you get receipts at the end of the year, they want two, three thousand dollars, and, and, and you make sure that they comply or they never get another grant again, so, um, it's uh, it, it's a problem. It was a problem. Uh, it's difficult, as the Senate President indicated, to give money to an agency that you don't have direct control over. You don't have the same safeguards and, and systems in place that you do with direct state departments. It's easier to watch dollars being administered by state departments. So that's that was an inherent problem, 
and it's one that uh, we were mindful of when we made the determination to uh, eliminate the, the entire process. Speaker, Senate question. Have, 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 have any other lawmakers been questioned in connection with the Allison matter? I'm not, I'm not aware of any. And I, as I've indicated before, I, I hear rumors every day, and they, they shift from subject to person. Uh, I, it's hard to deal with rumors. I've, I've been hearing rumors in, in, in this building. It's a political building, and there's just rumors all around all of the time. 99.9% .9 of which are false. I hear rumors. I ha I'm not aware of anybody else that has been questioned that is uh, a sitting member or otherwise. Uh, regarding the gallery. It's the same question, Speaker. Second question, I'm going to address that block. There's crossroads and, and the food bank. I'm going to get their money. Uh, and the little guy, Boy Scouts Parade, is going to get their money. Uh, who's not going to get money? Who's going to be disappointed here? The top of your remarks, you said they're going to be reduced. Who does? Who gets well, money? they're going to be reduced. I would, right now, a guesstimate from $11 million to maybe not $8 or $9 million. So there's, there's the small community service grants, as I've indicated, those were summarily eliminated. And I don't know who's not going to get them. It's going to be up to the department to administer them, uh, set, create a system where they make the determination. So depending on what the executive branch's determination is, a lot of folks may not get grants that have gotten in the past, and you may get have new entities uh, receiving grants in the future. So it's not our determination to make. We've, uh, we've uh, delegated that authority to the executive branch where I believe it should be. And, and they've got the systems in place to, in fact, monitor the, monitor the funds better than we do. Yes, Kathy. Thank you. Early on, you said that um, you were going to ban uh, giving the grants to agencies that pay legislators directly. That raises a whole set of circumstances. You have legislators who chair the boards of some of, at least one of the big recipients that has some problems. You have relatives that sit on the housing fund or other organizations that are recipients. How far is your rule going to go? How are you going to monitor it? What happens if you find out if somebody's <coughs> wife or husband lands on board of one of these organizations? Well, one, we're going to start over with an application process. Uh, if, if uh, certainly a legislator should not be one part of this agency, I believe. Uh, the application may include family members. So you decide on an application process and you expect people um, to, to be honest uh, to, to that process. And, uh, Is it going to apply to people who share boards as well? They may or may not be paying mm -hmm. I indicated employees. If you're, if you're a volunteer board chair, um, giving of your professional services and, and talents, to enhance a community need. I don't think that community should be penalized uh, because you're actually serving in a volunteer capacity. But if you're a paid share of a board, then I think that changes the dynamic. Now you're receiving remuneration through a state grant, which I believe is inappropriate. So I make a strong distinction between employees that are being compensated for their service and volunteers. We want to encourage volunteers. We want more people uh, participating in community agencies that serve the public's interest. So we, we don't want to discourage it. I, I want all of my general assembly members, or to, you know, my, my house colleagues, to go out and work as much as they are able to in the community, serve in a volunteer capacity as frequently as they can, because that makes that community a better place. You should not, you should not penalize, penalize organizations that we're trying to help you out while we're here. To follow up on Ted's question a few moments ago, you said you thought, you assumed that as part of the Allison investigation, those records would be looked at. Do you know that they have been requested? Have you gotten any response from me that they can't turn them over to your auditor because they've been subpoenaed by you? No, no. I, I mean, as, as frankly as I can answer the question, I had heard that. Uh, and, you know, heard is a rumor, so I shouldn't even say it, but I have heard that, that um, the, the federal authorities or the state authorities were looking at AEP. I, I don't know. They don't confer with me. They don't, they, uh, on their investigations. Uh, so I, I would uh, expect that they are and hope that they are. See, I am just on Kathy's question from before on the board chair. So Anastasia Williams and the John Hope, they can continue to receive grants. 
I, I, I'm not going to single anybody up, but what I will say is if a legislator is working in a volunteer position, I don't think that should uh, prohibit um, that, that organization from receiving state grant money. I, I think we should encourage people to volunteer and serve community needs. And legislators oftentimes do that uh, to, just because of their desire to serve their community. So in doing so, you, you, you would, such a rule would actually prohibit legislators from getting as involved in their communities as they would like and, and depriving the community of that volunteer. Are you, are you both satisfied with the level of transparency on the legislative grants, the ones we aren't doing anything? Well, we have an application process. After the grant uh, is, is received and, and uh, the purpose of the grant is fulfilled, hopefully, we require receipts back. So we look at we look at the application, the purpose of the grant, we get the receipts, make sure it's fulfilled, or they're never able to get a grant again. From what I understand from organizations that, that uh, give grants out uh, professionally, um, that's that's the same process that's utilized. So I I am until someone shows me or how to do it better. I mean, there's always a better way to build a better mousetrap, and I'm always everything is always subject to review and improvement and reform. And someday I'm sure we'll look at it and we'll have a better process. But right now, it's I'm satisfied that the process is the industry standard the way everybody else. Can we let the Senate President respond to that? I mean, once again, as the speaker has said, the current application process for Senate legislative grants, then I believe the House, at least for the ACLS guidelines, they have to put both meet the purpose, the objective of the grant, they have to provide a budget breakdown of the grant award, they have to put the total budget income and expense of the agency, they also have to confirm, as the speaker alluded to, the use of the prior year's grant amount. Um, including copies of paid invoices, receipts. Uh, they also will have to provide a federal taxpayer identification W-9 form. Any agency that receives a legislative grant, and once again, this goes to the report because this only applied to the legislative grants. It did not apply to the community service objective grants, if I may finish, if I may finish. Um, they have to be recognized as a domestic nonprofit organization and have a federal taxpayer ID number issued through the Internal Revenue Service. Um, we have guidelines with regard to fringe benefits, salaries. Um, we also have in place that administrative overhead costs shall not exceed 30% of the agency cost, and that the final grant reports. Um, of the last year's funding must be reported with the application and failure to comply results in withdrawal of funding. The only step that the speaker and I have taken in light of this is to say we are going to ensure coordination through JCLS of all grant applications to ensure that there is, a, if a grant application is denied, for example, on one side, whether it's because they didn't have a W-9 or they had a return receipt, that the JCLS would be the bank to ensure. So, so once yes, again, yes. unlike unlike the community service objective grants, it's important to know all of the requests are online and all of the grants that are awarded are online now. So the transparency piece is there, the accountability piece is there. Unfortunately, as the speaker said, that is in lacking the community service objective grants. We awarded it. Majority of them did, were accountable, did the right thing. But as the press has appropriately highlighted, there were systemic failures, and that makes it necessary for us, as been alluded to by some appropriately, under separation of powers, to delegate that authority to the executive branch. It sounds like you're saying yes on yes. that. Yes. 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 Do you think? that legislators who are employed by these organizations that are getting either type of grant should be stepping down or else they're going to lose their grant? That are employed? Yeah. Well, I leave, that, I leave that to the legislator and or the organization to make those determinations. I, I don't think it's it's appropriate for us to make that determination. <coughs> What's appropriate for us to decide is 
if an agency employs a legislator, they should not get any type of appropriation or grant from the state to perform a community, a community service because those resources should not go to the pay of a legislator. And does this make those disclosure forms even more important? There have been multiple lawmakers who made mistakes didn't report income or certain jobs. Now, they could potentially not receive grants based on the fact that they weren't there. So how important are those disclosure forms? Well, they're all, they've always been vitally important. Um, you know, I, I fill those the, the social forms out, and I sit there and I think for a few minutes. And every once in a while, I say, oh, I forgot that. You know, let me make sure I, I put that on. So I can actually see how a quick perusal and, you know, a quick once through on the form, you, you forget things. Uh, because, you know, we have, sometimes we have complicated lives, and you forget things that you were involved with a year ago, uh, and, and I have always made sure I study the question and I study the answer. I don't ask my wife, and I, you know, I try to ask my children to make sure that they're complete. And to my knowledge, my disability forms have always been very, very complete and accurate. They are of vital importance because they fulfill a community need. The community needs to know where the interests of the, the, the general assembly members are, so that they can make a determination of whether or not there's a conflict. You should not act on anything. Uh, an elected official should not act on anything where there's a conflict. So the forms are appointed for us. I have two questions following up on some of these questions. Do you know of any one question? Last question. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make that determination. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, following up on, on the last question that was asked, um, are you aware of anyone other than Red Allison who has been working for somebody receiving a grant from the legislature? No, I am not. No, I am not. Um, so, but when you're when you're making reforms, you you want to be as thorough as possible, and you would you would almost you wouldn't have to say that. Um, and, and, and it wouldn't be a problem, but to the extent that we're making reforms, you want to be thorough, you want to say that uh, no legislator should receive any remuneration from state resources, you know, from through this grant process. So there's no other list. Um, the question was, should they resign? And I'm not aware of any of I am not aware of anybody at this time. Um, the other question, totally unrelated, is here you all are, the people who 20 years ago for the public press conference to announce you've reached a agreement on a budget, and it's coming out tomorrow, and these are the key things you want to tell us about the budget. So changing gears completely here. Tomorrow. Have you reached the agreement on the press conference? Will we tell Probably not, but we'll, I'll, I'll make sure we talk. That would be good, but what can you tell us today? We make sure you talk to everyone and not just the crowd. Yeah, we'll talk to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have reached substantial agreement um, on the budget, so we posted it. It's, it's, it. The budget is a complex document, so we're, we're looking at individual issues and we're looking at them to make them better from both of, you know, both our chambers' perspectives. And, you know, when, when we have a final document, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see it tomorrow. But I will be glad, as I always am, to, to talk to as many folks. Why no press conference this year? There's always been a press conference. I didn't say there wasn't going to be one. Who knows? Have you made that determination yet? We'll get through, we'll get through this one where we're going to go it's work. Historically, we've let the change. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The, it, it hasn't been the speaker myself. The chair. Right. Historically, way back, it would be the Senate President and the House Speaker. It's <laughs> the state with the governor and the analysis they These are the things you were most proud of that you have been able to. There's actually, I'm sorry to send you off, but I, I'm, there's a lot of things that we're going to be very proud of, so we're going to be happy to talk to you tomorrow. It's a very, very good question. Can you mention, just deal with maybe two or three of them? Um, the governor wanted to raise taxes. You talked about the tax cuts. What do you think? I'd like to see it. You'll see it. You'll see, you'll see it tomorrow. I'm not going to answer any budget questions because it's still. It's still somewhat in flux, and, and as I've been thinking, we're going to look at it. Yeah, I'm about legislative grants. Go ahead. So, 
was the Cranston Police Department the only police department that was in need of state funding? And if not, why is that the only one that received state funding? That's the only request I had from state funding from a police department. I received, you know, I received a request from a fire department that's not not, not a Cranston department, and we're going to try to address that particular need. So the one that I, I received a request from. Uh, we have to fulfill. If I would have requested funding, would that be? I mean, that, that would not be a community service. That's because 